Kids these days are terrible. Social media and those video games warp their minds and allow malevolent forces to destroy our culture's most fundamental values. Secret cabals indoctrinate them into wokeness, allowing an invasion of immigrants to replace the outgoing generation. Oh, won't somebody please think about the children? Hey, Cypher here. It seems the rate of moral panics has increased of late, hasn't it? Well, there is a reason for that, but many of y'all may not have noticed. After all, what even is a moral panic? It's essentially fear-mongering and conspiracism about a supposed cultural threat that's ultimately overblown or outright false. Culture, as in the customs and habits of a particular group or population, resides in its adherence. So this is people trying to protect their culture. Typically, it revolves around halting things children are doing or something that may affect children because they are the next generation, that which transmits culture into the future. The key factor is that these reactions are disproportionate to the threat if not an outright lie. Some recent examples have been all the fuss over whether video games caused mass shootings, drag queens supposedly grooming children, or critical race theory turning kids into reverse racists. These are all moral panics. While they may seem somewhat superfluous or even a bit silly or nonsensical, they are deeply harmful and should be resisted. Moral panics typically have an alternative motive of gaining power for cultural protectors, which is why it is mostly used by conservatives, but not exclusively. Moral panics predate conservatism altogether. So while they may be used as a political tactic in the ever-ebbing culture war, which I have an episode on if you want to learn about the culture war, moral panics as a whole have a much wider history to it than that. There's a pattern to them, and they're actually well-studied. As such, there's a long history to them. So I made this episode in the hope that you can learn and be better prepared to identify them in the future. This episode is made possible by viewers like you, thanks to all of my patrons on Patreon for their support, as well as those who buy my merchandise. Having to keep to safe and unchallenging history is an increasing problem for history tubers, because of moral panics, which we will see in this episode. I'd have probably had to have succumbed to that if it weren't for all of your support. Sociologist Stanley Cohen coined the phrase moral panic when he described a particular sequence of events in 1969. Some minor riots in British seaside towns by mods and rockers resulted in sensational news coverage, much of which took the tone of an existential threat. And finally, people sought to do something to stop such a deviant culture from affecting Britain as a whole, even though the threat that they opposed was non-existent. Cohen identified a specific sequence that a moral panic follows along with characters that drive it. First is the target of the panic, a folk devil that can be maligned, an irrational threat to a culture. In Cohen's example, it was the mods, but folk devils can be pretty much anything from specific commentators to entire mediums and groups of people. In fear-mongering about a folk devil, a disaster mentality develops. They act like there's some epidemic that must be addressed. That eventually diffuses into public discourse, where regular people are scared of the folk devil. You're a little animal, that's what you are, you want to be locked up! Which of course promulgates into a push for policy changes, where law enforcement and public officials seek power in order to address the panic. 
two distinct types of people give that push, crusaders and profiteers. The former are the ones who honestly believe that the folk devil is an existential threat to their society, hence why they head a crusade to defeat that looming disaster. The latter, on the other hand, use the panic to gain power for themselves. They do not need to believe in the slander, only that they seek to profit from it. Crusaders and profiteers form a symbiotic relationship with the express intent of promulgating fear about a folk devil. They take advantage of that disaster mentality to implement policy. There's one characteristic thing that these moral panics are supposedly meant to protect, and that is children. The calling card of such events is perfectly summed up by this. <laughs> Think about the children, whoa! They are the next generation, so some change that affects them will eventually affect society as a whole. By this logic, cultural threats are especially pronounced for children, thereby deserving of more stringent defense. This is why censorship is the most common policy goal during a moral panic. By removing any mention of a folk devil, they believe that its specter can no longer affect youth culture. That's why moral panics often take the form of blood libel, as in the conspiracy theory of a folk devil, often anti-Semitically coded, is somehow sacrificing children to better themselves. That's why so many conspiracy theories involve child predation. It's blood libel. But the innocence of children is a rather new invention. As Philip Aries shows in Centuries of Childhood, immaculate youth was not a serious consideration until the 15th century. Before, they were essentially helpless little humans waiting until they were big enough for real work. So moral panics weren't really possible until the development of childhood as an innocent time before adulthood. Of course, there's always been complaints of kids these days. Aristotle complained that the youth are high-minded because they have not yet been humbled by life, nor have they experienced the force of circumstances. They think they know everything and are always quite sure about it. Intergenerational disputes and confusion is not a moral panic. That is the nature of older people seeing younger people and vice versa. But there were more similar circumstances to what a moral panic would become. His mentor was Plato, and his mentor was Socrates, a man arrested for corrupting the youth with his philosophizing in 399 BC, which we'll get to later. So there were ancient equivalents to moral panics, showing that there is a history to them, and they're not static. Yet childhood became a time of innocence two millennia later. By the 18th century, people were saying things like, the free access which many young people have to romances, novels, and plays has poisoned the mind and corrupted the morals of many a promising youth. Even the concept of teenager didn't come until the 20th century. Adolescence has of course always been around, but not an entire concept of particular teenager culture. So fear of juvenile delinquency, teenage rebellion, and the folk devils that cause it are only possible once those identities have been constructed, either in the early modern period for children and turn of the 20th century for teenagers. Yet there is one more component for moral panics particularly unique to its profiteers. They possess ulterior motives. These are mostly politicians and public commentators, often derided as grifters. There's three ways of using moral panics for reasons other than protecting the next generation. First and foremost is political gain, as in the granting of power to address the threat that has wider implications. They fearmonger in order to gain political power. The other two of these ultimately serve to do that, but not directly. One is the construction of deviance, as in classifying people or things as unacceptable deviations from social norms. Folk devils get labeled as deviant, but it is also anyone vaguely associated with them as well. It is a way of excluding people. 
And then the third motive is distraction. Moral panic profiteers will seek to avoid and deflect from their deficiencies by fear-mongering about folk devils. Now you might notice that moral panics seem to be inherently conservative, but they aren't exactly. They are about preserving the status quo from something new that's affecting culture, yes, but liberals and leftists are perfectly capable of identifying folk devils that are hindering youth culture. Y'all might remember how overblown the fear about a pewdie pipeline or alt-right pipeline was? Though there is certainly a radicalizing effect from social media's attention economy and other perverse incentives, there was no nefarious scheme to use YouTube's algorithm to turn kids into Nazis or whatever. That was a conspiracy theory, and therefore incorrect, and that's what fueled a moral panic from the left. If it's made into an overblown threat that's going to disrupt the next generation, it can be anything. So while they may be mostly conservative, they are not always. Also, moral panics are not the same as other forms of mass hysteria, like red scares and xenophobia. Those are about politics and ethnicity, but these things certainly can overlap. McCarthyism sometimes turned into a moral panic about how they're teaching Marxism in school, but it didn't start as that. McCarthyism was more concerned about rooting out communists within the federal government rather than how it was affecting children or the morals of society. No, the main focus of moral panic paranoia is to defeat some sort of cultural threat. So it's very useful to be able to identify moral panics, but they have a history to them that makes it much more complex than simply defining the problem. There are multiple kinds of moral panics that all separate around the type of folk devil they focus on. Decrying the use of the next generation for some kind of nefarious cultural gain goes back millennia. Human sacrifice was very much a real practice, and indeed, sometimes children were specifically killed. It was clearly attested in Mesoamerican ritual practices, and there is some evidence of witch doctors sacrificing children in Uganda as recently as a decade ago. We have textual and archaeological evidence that Phoenicians and Canaanites did it in the Levant, Sicily, Malta, and Carthage. The Bible tells stories of Abraham attempting to kill his son on God's behalf, and God smiting all the firstborn sons of Egypt shows that it was a phenomenon that Jews were at least aware of. But the books of the Bible actually prohibit child sacrifice. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, Any Israelite or any foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his children to Moloch is to be put to death. The members of the community are to stone him. I myself will set my face against him and will cut him off from his people. For by sacrificing his children to Molech, he has defied my sanctuary and profaned my holy name. This passage gives a rubric for moral panics to come. Accusations of child sacrifice could suffice to condemn anyone, whether or not it was true. Hence the whole blood libel part of conspiracism surrounding moral panics today. It stems from very real child sacrifice turned into easy slander to hurl at anyone's enemies. Romans would certainly use this as an excuse to justify the Punic Wars, even though Romans certainly had some practices of human sacrifice themselves, as Tolden Stone has spoke of on his channel, plenty of ancient authors confirm Phoenicians and their descendants did so with children. One of them was Plato himself, who said, The Carthaginians sacrifice people as being a holy and lawful act with them. This is depicted as a conversation where a character talks about how evil barbarians are, the back and forth of a made-up conversation that Plato employs in order to develop a point is called the Socratic method because of who the interlocutor is. 
Socrates. He's arguing that laws aren't inherently justified, only accepted as normal, something that would end up biting him back in 399 BC. Athenians indicted him with two allegations under the heads, respectively, as we should say, of religion and of morality. The mischief to morality is the perversion of the youth. The offense against religion is the setting forth of strange gods in the place of those of the state. Notice that this 1870s translator is making the differentiation between religion and morality because the religious charges were far worse than corrupting kids with ideas. Nonetheless, here we have a clear moral panic developing. The strongest contemporary criticism of Socrates comes from an Aristophanes comedy that simply portrays him as a blowhard with his head in the clouds. He was essentially a scapegoat for the anger of Athenians during a time of Spartan hegemony. One of Socrates' students was a leader of the Thirty Tyrants that ruled Athens. Of course, in Plato's telling, Socrates was mostly using the ordeal as a way to philosophize about justice. But that is mostly Plato putting words in his mouth, which Plato in turn used to advocate his own way of protecting children with collective childcare in his ideal republic of philosopher aristocrats. In Plato's telling, Socrates had argued against the very democracy which would eventually execute him, and while it's difficult to tell what truly happened, it showed how moral panics would work for centuries as in the protection of a particular form of government from its dissidents. As Rome took over the Greek world and the rest of the Mediterranean, they took on that ethos. Periodic scares about foreign religion or the return of kings would grip Rome and its remnants. At first, Christians were the thing to be feared, but eventually they feared the pagans they replaced. These weren't really moral panics as sociologists think of them today. They were not about protecting the next generation from malignant cultural influences. After all, there was this whole concept of cynicism. <laughs> that a key tenant is defacing the coinage, which is kind of a joke about defacing customs. So it's inherently cynical to oppose moral panics. Rather, these panics were more about keeping Christendom as Catholic or Orthodox and expanding that influence. The Crusades themselves weren't moral panics, but something that began around that time was the seed of moral panics to come. In 1144, a boy in Norwich named William was abducted and locals found his body with clear signs of torture. The Jewish community had only been there for a decade and locals claimed they had ritually sacrificed the kid. Thomas and Monmouth wrote a hagiography about this, which allowed others to tell the same story about other murdered children. These accusations grew to an entire mythology of Jews drinking children's blood or baking it into a special bread, hence why it's called blood libel. The anti-Semitism from these lies built up leading to a series of massacres in 1189 and 1190, killing around 150 Jews in England. After taxing and persecuting them for another century, England expelled Jews from their entire country. The fact that Jews were already ostracized and often the only people practicing money lending when Christians were strictly prohibited from doing so meant there was a financial incentive to persecute Jews, leading to recurring accusations of blood libel even today. This happens especially alongside conspiracism of their supposed elite control. Blood libel continues to underpin moral panics today, morphing to fit whomever is the new folk devil. It's almost funny how many of these horrible historical trends begin with anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. I suppose you can replace the word Jew with any they, but inevitably it still ends up being anti-Semitic. A new folk devil emerged for people to scapegoat. For centuries, apostates and dissenters had been burned as witches. Inquisitions sometimes formed to search for them, including whole crusades going after paganism and heretics. 
Just as the modern conception of childhood was forming, the fear of dark magic and sorcery-influenced rituals had mixed with blood libel. In 1484, the Pope issued a bull titled Sumis Desiderantes Affectibus, which stated many persons of both sexes, heedless of their own salvation and forsaking the Catholic faith, give themselves over to devils, male and female. We therefore desiring, as in our duty, to remove all impediments by which in any way the said inquisitors are hindered in the exercise of their office, and to prevent the taint of heretical pravity and of other like evils from spreading their infection to the ruin of others who are innocent. Soon enough, a text called Malleus Maleficarum gave ways of detecting these heresies. Inquisitors had another tool to harass outcasts, but witch hunts really began in earnest after the Reformation began half a century later, meant as a way of controlling theology before it morphed any further. Any hint of impropriety or heresy, be it in the Catholic or Protestant world, could be met with accusations of witchcraft and therefore prosecuted. By the end of the 16th century, hundreds of so-called witches burned throughout Europe, and in a way, these were essentially the deadliest moral panics in history, taking tens of thousands of lives over a few centuries, with several times that convicted but not executed. Blaming people for witchcraft was an easy way to declare someone's behavior or status was outside of societal and religious norms. Hence why they became so prominent during the Reformation, when public morals were in flux. Suddenly, old Catholic rituals were scary devilry, or the other way around was heresy poisoning a faithful community. They even threw in some blood libel with the idea of witch's ointment, which was an imaginary concoction made of dismembered babies. Witch hunts eventually died down throughout the late 17th to early 19th centuries, but other types of moral panics would take their place. These are not isolated incidents, but a pattern of behavior that cowards regularly use throughout history to ostracize people. Secret societies always caused suspicion. A classic example was the Knights of Templar. They were a crusader order that had temples throughout Europe. They came to basically be like a banking system. But in 1307, after two centuries of existence, France charged members with heresy, claiming they were devil worshippers. Under torture, some admitted to unholy rituals being part of their secret procedures. These accusations spread like wildfire and allowed monarchs to dispossess the order of all its wealth and execute many of its members. This pattern would repeat frequently, but soon it was reinforced with blood libel. Two secret societies of the 18th century are still frequently the focus of conspiracism today. One of them began as a simple guild for masons who traveled throughout Europe, where they could freely stay at lodges. Much like any medieval guild, they had initiation rituals. These Freemason lodges steadily admitted outsiders, basically becoming a club to meet in secret. Freemasonry probably helped spread Enlightenment ideas throughout Europe and their colonies. Many elites in those societies were members. Some historians argue Freemasonry likely contributed to the French and American revolutionary sentiments, but Freemasonry wasn't directly involved. Another secret society that spread Enlightenment ideas was founded specifically to do so in 1776 Bavaria, which was called the Order for Illumination, or simply Illuminati. Yes, they were a real group, and they were dedicated to Enlightenment values, the same values of the American Revolution, which just so happened to be the same year as the founding of the Illuminati. You can understand why conspiracy theorists regularly mix up Freemasons with this short-lived organization. 
Conspiracists, at their core, are history and science deniers, hence why they get banned on this channel. Conspiracism is a form of bigotry, directly opposed to the history profession. The actual Illuminati were secret because the monarchy obviously opposed such seditious sentiment as republicanism and liberalism, the very enlightenment ideas the organization was founded to spread. Yet, members really couldn't keep the existence of the group from leaking out to the general public, especially when many became boastful. Both Freemasonry and the Bavarian Illuminati actually, like, publicly showed themselves, despite being officially secret. Because of the conservative reaction to the Revolutionary Age, a series of conspiracy theories about Freemasonry and the Illuminati secretly directing these revolutions spread like wildfire. Such conspiracism often involved the idea that sacrificing children was a part of the supposedly devil-worshipping rituals of Freemasonry and the Illuminati. These typically explicitly claimed that Masons or the Illuminati were a secret cabal of Jews asserting some sort of globalist New World Order, something that's repeated well into the present, often just copying this stuff from the early 19th century or Nazi versions from the 1930s. Blood libel is never far away during a moral panic. And yes, Nazis killed between 80 and 200,000 Freemasons because of this conspiracy theory. The real Illuminati was already riven with division and got banned in 1785. They barely existed. Its founder, Adam Weissop, tried to keep the order alive through secret correspondence, but Bavarian authorities easily stopped it and censored his writings. So he kept publishing in exile. Yes, the Illuminati, the actual Illuminati, were suppressed by conservatives because they might overthrow a king. Hmm. Actually, sounds like the Illuminati were a pretty cool group of folks. Even though Vysopt was kind of a dictator at times within the group, he was off in his own little wacky world. The Illuminati were actually just kind of a tiny little group in Bavaria that shouldn't have made any difference to anyone because they didn't. They didn't matter. In the late 1790s and early 1800s, Americans had a whole moral panic about Illuminati infiltration of the government, but Thomas Jefferson couldn't even prove it and nobody cared after just a few years. Freemasons, on the other hand, had an entire political party devoted to their expulsion, but that fell apart pretty easily. One can understand how fears of secret societies cause moral panics. This can really be anything considered too esoteric for easy comprehension. Hence why you'll find fear-mongering about the CIA, FBI, or Federal Reserve, and that can develop into moral panics. They see some sort of secrecy and then claim that the secrecy is sacrificing children or corrupting them or whatever with the express intent of destroying the culture or whatever. It's a pretty standard kind of moral panic and it's been with American society ever since the beginning. It's all too common. Opposition to immigrants can often lead to moral panics. The fear is that immigrants will too drastically change society and ruin the next generation. For nearly half a century, the United States was gripped by xenophobia about Irish immigrants, starting with a massive influx of them in the 1840s, due to the Great Potato Famine. Opponents to these demographic changes spread rumors that Irishmen would Catholicize the United States and make it beholden to the Pope. Even before that, there had been much conspiracism about convents in America, supposedly imprisoning women as nuns for the gratification of priests. An 1832 riot burned a convent in Charlestown, Massachusetts. Such violence became mainstream when the Irish came in massive numbers in the 1840s. A secret society formed to fight the supposed secret society of Catholic immigrants. 
called Know Nothings because of their unwillingness to divulge how it functioned, though they preferred to call themselves Native Americans because they were natives opposing immigrants. It's actually a reason why we probably shouldn't use the term Native Americans to refer to indigenous people. Nativity just refers to being born somewhere, not indigeneity. Us natives, born rightwise to this fine land, or the foreign hordes defiling it. As early as 1844, nativist riots regularly broke out targeting Irishmen. Know Nothings even formed the Native American Party to push for legislation, beginning the xenophobic slogan of America First. Some even reversed blood libel onto what they called popishness, as in Catholicism. They refused that Catholics were even Christian, a form of bigotry that remains today. This hysteria continued for decades, even if the Know Nothings failed in the 1850s. Fenian societies, which promoted the independence of Ireland through the patronage of Irish Americans, became a perfect boogeyman in the 1860s as they launched a series of failed raids into Canada, which led to their union, which yeah, Canada is actually kind of founded on filibustering from the United States. But yeah, that was the basis of the creation of Canada. Fenians were supposedly radicalizing the United States and therefore a frequent target of renunciation. The Grant administration attempted to ban Catholic schools to prevent Catholicizing children. We'd still hear this bigotry resume during President Kennedy's election with fears of him supposedly being loyal to the Pope, which would irrevocably ruin American culture by his mere election. Obviously, that was wrong, but further nativist panics took its place. For instance, in the 1870s, there were claims that Chinese people were kidnapping American children and enslaving them. Such falsehoods help fuel legislation excluding Chinese immigration altogether. Yeah, some of the Chinese must-go stuff was inherently a moral panic. Nativism still fuels many moral panics today. Just think of the fears of terrorism after 9-11 coming across the border, or how supposedly schools were teaching Sharia law. Donald Trump announced his presidential candidacy in 2015 with a moral panic saying this about immigrants. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. The classic sign of a moral panic is exaggeration of a threat and calls for harsh protective measures against that threat. Hence why Trump said that. He even adopted the whole America First slogan. From this day forward, it's going to be only America First. America First. After other such noble presidents like Woodrow Wilson had taken on the slogan, Wilson! Nazi sympathizers in the early 1940s and the Ku Klux Klan also used the nativist slogan. The next type of moral panic popped up because of changing technology. These come because of technological progress that threatens the culture. Savonarola's Bonfire of the Vanities in 1497 is an early version of this, where a monk encouraged burning thousands of objects because they were supposedly tempting people into sin. Such destruction is a clear warning sign of a medium-inspired moral panic. Those who oppose tech or are simply not proficient with it are oftentimes called Luddites. One can argue that all historians are Luddites, by the way, if you go onto my Discord server, which, you know, obviously I have some technological savvy given all of this, but, uh, you know, they'll still call me Luddite all the time because, well, I'm not as savvy as I make myself out to be, I guess? Yeah, because 
is an inherent part of the profession that, uh, you know, we're stuck in the past and therefore we are Luddites. Stay on target. We're too close. Stay on target. <laughs> But the term is named after a moral panic of the early 19th century. With industrial looms growing in popularity, laborers lost their jobs. Mobs would form in England to destroy the looms. Some left notes saying they did so by order of General Ludd, referring to a legendary loom breaker from 1779. But laborers found work nonetheless and realized that looms were not really something to be feared. That's the inherent problem of technological progress. Sometimes it seems like it'll lose jobs, but new jobs arrive in other ways. Basically, every new medium has caused a panic like this. Everything from radio to social media makes for easy targets for censorious calls, claiming that the medium itself is, as one book claimed during the comic book scare of the post-war era, a seduction of the innocent. They claim that sex and violence depicted in some medium causes juvenile delinquency and misbehavior. Such hysteria grew enough during the supposed plague of comics to cause book burnings. These aren't pictures of Nazi Germany, that's the United States after defeating Nazi Germany still burning books just because they happen to have Superman on it. Though I should say there were plenty of comic books that depicted gory death and whatnot. Graphic depictions of violence doesn't excuse book burning or banning or whatever. A year after the publication of that libelous book, comic book companies agreed to self-censor themselves and only allow the sale of ones that the Comic Code Authority stamp approved of. This is often considered the breaking point between the Golden Age and Silver Age of comics. The Comic Code would rule for another three decades significantly impinging on what comics could do and say. My favorite comic series was always the Green Lantern Green Arrow series from the Silver Age, but it basically ended because of comic authority censorship. We wouldn't really see the end of comic censorship until stuff like this was coming out. And this is often regarded as the greatest comic book of all time. Given how much comics matter to the culture today, this moral panic actually had a huge detrimental effect on many generations to come. And the same thing happened for many other mediums, such as with movies before World War II. Fear of them glorifying violence and sexual depravity led to a religious campaign against movies, which resulted in a form of self-censorship called the Hayes Code. That ruled Hollywood until the rating system replaced it in the late 1960s and 70s. Radio, television, jazz, rock, and rap all faced similar moral panics. These often hinged on racist complaints about black people encouraging crime or lewd behavior. But that can be subsumed when fear-mongering about music being too risque for children. The Parents Music Resource Center led by Tipper Gore, wife of Al Gore, created a circus in Congress in 1985 through the Parental Advisory Sticker, which almost became a badge of honor on albums. As you can see, protecting children allows people to easily remove free speech. As one jurist says, harm to minors has become the primary justification for censorship and classification schemes in the United States. One of these medium-based moral panics took the old blood libel accusation with it. In the 1980s, heavy metal music and games like Dungeons and Dragons were catching on. At the same time, negligent psychotherapists claimed they recovered memories in patients of traumatic childhoods involving satanic rituals. This started with the 1980 book Michelle Remembers, which made numerous false allegations of satanic abuse and made way for numerous copycat claims of daycare and teacher abusers. The religious right was particularly powerful at the time given that Ronald Reagan was in office, so the public quickly associated these lurid tales with D&D and heavy metal. 
Several actual child abuse scandals throughout the decade supercharged allegations of games and music making way for child sacrifice. This was the Satanic Panic, and it ended just as rapidly as it started. The real fear was the secularization of schools, something that Ronald Reagan himself railed against. And conservatives used these claims of ritualized abuse to push for school prayer as an antidote. But the root of secularization remains an intense debate even today. Another classic panic over new mediums was video games causing violence, much like the juvenile delinquency of comics before that. This came to a head in 1993, when the US Senate began hearings on games, which resulted in the Entertainment Software Rating Board. The ESRB is another self-censorship organ, much like any other rating system. But video games remain a convenient scapegoat to deflect from violence in American society, with recurring panics every few years. Video games, I'm hearing more and more people say the level of violence on video games is really shaping young people's thoughts. Now I should say there is a link between gameplay and increased aggression. This is actually measured. A meta-study proves this, but no direct cause has been found between real-world violence and video games. So every moral panic about video games and violence is an unnecessary diversion from actual causes of violence. As a historian of American violence, which is very much what I specialize in, yeah, this is a huge problem. People will literally use any kind of like, oh, the media shows violence as a way to deflect from like changes in society that are causing violence. The panic is an unnecessary diversion from actual causes of violence. We've seen much the same with social media, but hopefully this is easy to spot now. When a marginalized group gains even a modicum of visibility or equality, inevitably a moral panic ensues, rendering that group into folk devils. A prominent version of this was the justification for Jim Crow. After Reconstruction failed to secure the rights of black people, states unencumbered by military governance and brought under the rule of reactionary Democrats, called Redeemers, they sought to redeem the South through first disenfranchisement of black men and the segregation of black people altogether, much of which was reinforced with white supremacist terrorism. I've done a whole lecture on how Jim Crow worked if you want to check that out. Whites often justified this as protection of white women and children against marauding blacks. Many accusations of miscegenation, as in interracial relationships, brought communities together to lynch black men for having supposedly raped or molested white women. It's the most common underlying fear that propels racists even today. This is why we still see the continued repetition of the old conspiracy theory that other races are replacing white people. To quote journalist Molly Evans when reporting about Pat Buchanan's culture war speech from 1992, Abortion on demand, a litmus test for the Supreme Court, homosexual rights, discrimination against religious schools, Bruh. women in combat units, that's change all right, but that's not the kind of change America needs, it's not the kind of change America wants and it's not the kind of change we can abide in a nation we still call God's country. It probably sounded better in the original German. If you use the term replacement, if you suggest the Democratic Party is trying to replace the current electorate, the voters now casting ballots, with new people, more obedient voters from the third world. 
but they become hysterical because that's that's what's happening actually. Let's just say it, that's mm. true. Ein Volk, das nicht auf die Reinheit seiner Rasse hält, geht zugrunde. Western civilization is our birthright. It makes all good things possible. Undefended, it collapses. Adolf says it isn't fair. And der Fehrer knows that to hook him. He's being oppressed. <laughs> to a growing number of internal issues that led Fox to Carlson's firing, the Times reports. Replacement theory is very obviously false and, well, racist, but it justifies the backlash to recent criticism of law enforcement for being too racist. That's how backlashes work. But the folk devils can sometimes be fairly well hidden. Suburbanites will often raise Cain about changes in their neighborhoods, such as redistricting and so-called outsiders coming in. Historian Kais Reismandel argues, A new era began in the mid-1970s. New local threats undermine the expectations and understandings of suburban life as tranquil, safe, and family friendly. This eroded the status of the suburban as refuge from the conflict and discord often located in the city, and thereby created a neighborhood of fear. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! These new understandings of suburbia, fueled by real incidents and their reproduction in media, both altered the long standing expectation of that space as safe particularly for children and teens, and buttressed the overriding and often exaggerated sense of criminal danger. Suburban invasion narratives are a common theme in moral panics. Protecting the character of a neighborhood from folk devils easily disguises backlashes, be it racial minorities or lower classes. The most recent American panics have used similar methodology. When the Black Lives Matter movement became prominent in the late 2010s, much of the media spectacle was around suburban invasion and race riots, allowing people to dismiss the police brutality that drove such events because BLM had no ability to organize civil disobedience and keep protesters from turning to violence because they were a disorganized movement, not a specific organization. It's kind of difficult to prevent social violence when you refuse to organize. Civil disobedience is nothing without organization. It's funny that I've got episodes addressing both race riots and police brutality released within a couple months of each other. Both age-restricted by Team YouTube, by the way. Yet I'll regularly get people refusing to watch both and claiming I only covered one or the other. You can be simultaneously opposed to police brutality and riots. Actually, it's not really that hard of a position to take, but inevitably, a moral panic about all of these things ensued. They claim that Black Lives Matter, BLM, was a terrorist organization, a blatant falsehood. BLM is a movement, not an organization, so it can't possibly be a terrorist organization when it's not an organization. It's basically just a hashtag on Twitter. While condoning riots hurts the cause, condemning them as terrorists ignores reality. A well-intentioned project by the New York Times attempted to address systemic racism with a progressive history curriculum called the 1619 Project. It had many many flaws, but then President Trump insinuated they were trying to indoctrinate children into terrorism. The bumbling buffoonery that ensued as Trump created the 1776 Commission to make its own incredibly inept report, which you can watch me read and a group of us discuss in previous live streams, showed the profiteering ways of this backlash. These folks don't care about history, they only care about scoring points against black people, gay people, trans people, or whatever. Anyone who is deemed a folk devil. In this case, it didn't work, but the nonsense would continue in the United States. 
It's particularly obvious with attacking transgender people as grooming children. Yes, the groomer panic is but another backlash to trans people having any form of visibility. Silly fun like drag queens get turned into monsters out to trans your children. Back in the 70s, gay people were attacked in exactly the same way. What Jimmy didn't know was that Ralph was sick. A sickness that was not visible like smallpox but no less dangerous and contagious, a sickness of the mind. You see, Ralph was a homosexual, but payments were expected in return. But all homosexuals are not passive. Some resort to violence. It was hateful bullshit then, and it's hateful bullshit now. People are merely afraid of the fact that trans folk have gained more visibility in any form. When a transphobe says, I'm not afraid of the trees. Yes, they truly are afraid. These are the bloviations of cowards unwilling to suppress the fear they feel at the mere presence of scary trans people. Hence why they seek to suppress the visibility of anyone they suspect as being trans, even though drag queens aren't actually trans. They're just cross-dressers, basically the equivalent of clowns, what that moral panic is doing is seeking to suppress the visibility of trans people. Indeed, I had a sponsor lined up for this episode, and I had to refuse their $800 on principle. Magellan TV proved to be homophobic because there was the mere mention of LGBT people. I told them that I refused to be sponsored by bigots. Of all the things to be concerned about in this episode, it was the mere mention of LGBT people's existence that was the problem for them. This is the point of a backlash. Magellan TV, concurring with homophobes and transphobes everywhere else in this moral panic, have decided that they'd prefer LGBT people to lose the visibility they've gained. I won't take a sponsorship from people attempting to erase history. Given Team YouTube's demonetization and age restriction problems, moral panics help deter public history engagement in these topics, further spreading ignorance and allowing backlashes. Instead of relying on bigoted sponsors, please consider donating to my Patreon. That is perhaps the only way I can continue making episodes applying history to the present. Conservative politicians are able to profiteer from crusading haters. Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. This is demagoguery, as in leaders who gain power and popularity by arousing the emotions, passions, and prejudices of the people. The grooming panic fits this pattern perfectly. And it didn't take long for politicians to jump into the fray. You know, I'd rather be governed by we the people than, than woke companies. And so I think pushback is in order across the board, including with Bud Light. They've even expanded this conspiracism to the new favorite buzzword of reactionaries, wokeness. <laughs> What's up? Crypto here. Have you noticed everything is woke now? You've got these so-called historians denigrating America's glorious past simply because there's some white supremacy in there? Get over it. Everywhere has a dark heritage, so why do I have to hear about it? I just can't stand this woke stuff. We used to be a nation. We were composed of nuclear families, and the politicians were righteously engaged in trying to eliminate communism from the darker parts of the world. Now men are afraid to fight each other in the open for the fear of namby-pamby SJWs canceling them. And you know who's to blame for that? It's the scholars injecting identity politics into everything. If history is supposed to be the story of us, like Cypher always seems to say, then why do I have to hear about all these un-American things like race, class, and gender? What happened to our heroes? Well, I'll tell you, history is woke now. 
It has nothing to do with my unwillingness to interrogate what actually happened. No, no, that can't be the case. That's why I don't need citations. Verifiability is for the weak. Dude, the wokesters are the real cowards for using critical race theory to make me feel bad about being white. It's okay to be white. They try to push their betters away by enforcing diversity, equity, and inclusion on everyone else. This is why Western civilization is declining. The j- <coughs> uh, I, I mean the wokesters are trying to replace us. They degenerate our society with this so-called history, cancel us for speaking out, and then teach it in schools. First they try to tell us that the Civil War was about slavery somehow. It was about states' rights, duh. Then they take away our heroes of the Wild West by saying that it's settler colonialism. And finally they even go after the Founding Fathers for being flawed when they were gods. Yet they won't accept the fact that Democrats haven't changed. Just like all socialists, especially national socialists, who were absolutely leftists, it's in the name. They're always trying to divide us by race, class, and gender. They can't build. They can only destroy our heritage and replace us. They're always calling us Nazis, so why not? At least that'll keep them from infecting our kids. It's the only way to secure our culture and the future of our children. For decades, we've heard idiotic complaints about political correctness, but that got tiresome. So reactionaries jumped to all kinds of gibberish, like social justice warriors, soy boys, and cucks. But they seem to have settled on the term woke. The term used to connote being aware of systemic inequality. I, I advise everybody to be a little careful when they go along through that, but stay woke, keep their eyes open. Everybody knows black or white, and but now it mostly just means anything vaguely progressive. And of course, the grooming panic has glommed onto this phrasing. To claim there's some cabal of people trying to trans children. Notice that it begins with the same old blood libel conspiracism. To sue doctors who have unforgivably performed these procedures on minor children. To determine whether they have deliberately covered up horrific long-term side effects of sex transitions in order to get rich. That if any teacher or school official suggests to a child that they could be trapped in the wrong body, they will be faced with severe consequences. As part of our new credentialing body for teachers, we will promote positive education about the nuclear family, the roles of mothers and fathers, and celebrating rather than erasing the things that make men and women different and unique. This new moral panic has passed legislation, such as the cringeworthy titled Stop Woke Act in Florida. Florida profiteers even brought back Trump's chicanery with abhorrent curriculum that emphasizes the lost cause myth and utilizes red-baiting propagandists like PragerU. Imagine being so deluded that you actually endorse PragerU as a legitimate resource for teaching within your entire state. Reactionaries are sowing mayhem at the state and local level since they failed with the nationwide level with the 1776 commission, which was pretty freaking laughable. Conniving profiteers like Christopher Rufo claim that an esoteric legal interpretation called critical race theory is teaching kids to hate white people. Programs to encourage diversity, equity, and inclusion can easily be identified as woke and therefore indoctrinating self-hatred. It's all either lies or overblown to the point of absurdity, but that's what moral panics do. Use a false or exaggerated threat as a way to define something as divergent or at variance from societal values and therefore worthy of elimination. It's all a cowardly way of hiding one's bigotry and, as King Richard I decrees, 
you can buy these shirts on my channel, bigots get banned. With this history in mind, moral panics should be easier to identify. They intentionally make a vague fear seem far worse than it possibly could be. All this demonization for unjust gains proves that these panics are only worthy of denunciation, at least when they're correctly identified. After all, what was the fear of cancel culture other than a moral panic about a misidentified moral panic? Remember, these follow a distinct sociological process. First arises an overblown threat. Journalists feed the frenzy, turning the subject of fear into a folk devil. Crusaders campaign to rid society of those devils, while profiteers use that fever in the body politic to advance their careers. Once people have spent enough energy in their little witch hunts, they'll move on to the next one, refusing to look back upon the wreckage that they've perpetrated. But historians... Mm-hmm. <laughs> Remember. Through the centuries, we've seen at least four types of moral panics revolving around distinct folk devils. Secret societies cause suspicion, allowing for a kind of conspiracism about their clandestine meetings and their purposes. Since anyone could theoretically be labeled a member, crusaders and profiteers may target anyone, including actual crusaders of the Knights of Templar. Immigrants instill a fear of them immigrating from foreign cultures into some false idea of pristine society, leading to nativist policies. New mediums bring up Luddite tensions as people attempt to prevent the fledgling industry from becoming popular or censoring it into their concept of decency. Finally, as marginalized groups gain even the slightest escape from their marginalization, backlashes attack them in the hope of putting the uppity folk back in their place. I'm sure there's other types, but these are the ones that represent a fairly large amount of moral panics, especially from the works cited in my bibliography. As with any episode, you can go read the books that I read in order to create this episode. But demagoguery can only get one so far. It is merely a reaction to change, an indication that that change will be successful. While secret societies might get repressed, foreigners excluded, censorship imposed, and new discrimination established, as soon as the panic wears off, new societies arise, regulations get relaxed, restrictions become easy to evade, and oppression slowly abates. Reactions always fail eventually, but while they are happening, they are inherently violent. Moral panics may seem ludicrous in hindsight, but they have serious consequences for the people they are labeling as folk devils. Profiteers are apathetic to the people they hurt, and crusaders seek to cause harm. Flippantly dismissing those persecuted along the way is a disservice. That is ignorance of the highest order, where one's silence encourages violence. Demagogues use this fear to gain political power because they're too cowardly to convince people of what good they can do for society. Two sociologists say, Attempting to launch a moral panic indicates an effort to invoke a consensus that beliefs or acts that are denounced are not insulated entities, but can infest, infect, undermine, and subvert the healthy societal body unless something is done, that is, immobilizes right thinking and acting members of the society to counter what is socially constructed as an ominous threat. Such fear-mongering is merely an effort to construct deviance. From that, we can say there's something deeper to the phenomenon. Folk devils reveal something about the society they originate from. Ultimately, moral panics concede that society is changing. To resort to conspiracism proves that resisting that change is futile. 
Everett Dirksen once got the Civil Rights Act passed by saying, It is said that on the night he died, Victor Hugo wrote in his diary substantially this sentiment, Stronger than all armies is an idea whose time has come. The time has come for equality of opportunity in sharing in government, in education, and in employment. It will not be stayed or denied. It is here. Moral panics cede the moral high ground to the very folk devils crusaders and profiteers seek to vilify. Crusaders fall on their swords once the panic recedes into irrelevance, while profiteers take their ill-begotten gains onto the next folk devil to fearmonger over. To engage in such fearmongering ultimately corrupts one's very integrity and recognizes that moral panics are a sign of weakness. Under the cover of their flimsy morality, they can do much damage. But a panic fails eventually, especially if regular people remember this history and how to identify this ridiculous strategy. <laughs> Hi. I got one sentence in. One sentence. <laughs> oh, that was a cute little squeak. <laughs> Hi. Oh. oh, think about the children. Whoa. Result. Wow. <laughs> Now, say it for the camera. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Every time I hear people blaming me for being a BLM sycophant or something, it's like, I, I don't particularly care about the Bureau of Land Management. Just, uh, what? Hey, um, give me kitty kisses, thank you. Not it was king. Meow. <laughs> now what? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? I'm drinking Highland Scotch today from Alexander Murray and Company. It's kind of like Glenlivet, but a cheaper version. Meow. 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 You went out? Wow. 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 His food just dispensed, so he really wants to get out of here. I'll I'll let you out. Sumis desidera Oh man, that's gonna be impossible. Sumis desideranta desiderantes affectibus. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. You're very cute. You're the one who decides whether or not you will be on camera. So, like, you don't get to complain. I know I've been recording for a long time. This is like fifth hour of recording or something like that. <laughs> Sing right. Oh, well, hello, King. <laughs> what are you doing? Are you going up there? Okay. States. <sighs> King. Taint. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, now you're causing havoc down there. What are you doing? Well, thank you. Yeah. Hi there. Oh, you just want to be hell, huh? No one. He just wants to be hell. Okay. I am King Richard the First's throne. Oh. And now he seeks escape. And I have suddenly become Duke of Bavaria or whatever. I hold you hostage and will require the entirety of the English people to uh, send me a ransom. Therefore, donate to my Patreon. Otherwise, King Richard I doesn't get freed. <laughs> yes, oh, that's a good boy. Okay, I gotta let you go. My arm's becoming weak. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Oh my God, he dipped his tail in whiskey. Yep, yep, it's whiskey for sure. <laughs> oh wait, I have Watchmen for sure. Hold on, I have to free it from the vodka. What are you gonna do? Thank you. Yes, you're a good boy. Kitty kisses all around. Kitty kisses equal licking the nose, by the way. Some people seem to not notice, but yeah, he's licking my nose. Because he's adorable. Meow. Meow. You'd think that the craziness of Prager U would be gone by now, but no, they just keep on coming. These folks are responsible for so much historical denialism. It's not even fun anymore. They're just assholes that oppose the historical profession, like my job. Put in and hello. Now what? Now what? I gotta do other things. I actually like this. This is good. Okay, thank you. Meow. 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 